We're beginning this flat out miracle film segment with a view out my little window in the sweet springtime. My window on the world. My ability to communicate. Welcome to Flat Out Miracle Films. Welcome to Wonder Stories. Keep a little child heart. Because there's some unusual things coming up. Well, we won't get into that right now. Boom. Well, 
enjoy the uh, the flat out miracle films and uh, there'll be more. David's traveling the country and there's plenty of stories. See you later. Bye. I went to the eye doctor and um, in back in the examination room and he was examining my eyes and he said, Dixie, what happened? The stigmatisms are gone. They're not there. And I said, God did it. And he said, God did it? And I said, yes, who do you think made a stigmatism? He said, God. And I said, no. I said, God sent his word to heal me and deliver me from destruction. And scripture just started rolling out of me. <laughs> and I, I just started speaking scripture, God's will, that we be healed. And God doesn't want people to be legally blind or blind. God wants people to be able to see because not being able to see or having poor vision or being legally blind is a sign of destruction to God. And so then he walked out and he said, Dixie's doing really, really well. And he said, I'm, a, I'm curious. I want you to come back and have the specialist examine your optic nerve. This is Dixie Turbofield and I am Sheila Adams. Dixie lives with me. And the first time I really saw Dixie was February 18th of 2006 and she came in to a prayer meeting in the basement of New Covenant Church in Marion with her knee inverted and her right foot inverted, her left hand drawn, she had scoliosis of the spine, she was blind, and she was being led by a friend of ours who supported her weight because she needed a, she needed a cane or support on one side. And she came into the meeting, we prayed for her, I remember praying for the release of the mother's love. Dixie had suffered rejection from father, mother, stepfathers, and stepmother. And we prayed for the Lord to supply her need for love by the power of His Holy Spirit. We prayed that the height, depth, length, and breadth of the love of Jesus would fill her. And I remember there was a deep release emotionally when that occurred. She wept and I wept. And I remember laying my hands on her eyes and saying, Eyes be opened in Jesus' name. Eyes be opened in Jesus' name. And then Von Berry, who was there also, did likewise and took his hands off her eyes. And she screamed, I can see, I can see. He put a Bible in front of her, and though she couldn't read the words, she could see the pages and see the black and white. So then... Um, Two men who were there, Vaughn and Vaughn Berry and David Akers, prayed for her leg, and we watched as her leg grew out and her foot turned. And we didn't know right then, but she said simultaneously, her toes on her right foot unlapped. They had been overlapped, and her toes unlapped, and her hand relaxed somewhat. It didn't totally open, but it relaxed. Uh, Vaughn prayed for her spine to be straightened. She went back to her back doctor, and the back doctor released her. She had had scoliosis of the spine and a herniated disc, and surgery was going to be necessary. But when she went back to the back doctor, she was released, and that was Dr. Who? Um, I think Moody, is, he's in Marion. Dr. Dr. Moody in Marion was the back doctor. Take, and, her, take her hand. Hold her hand. And I took back... The other, the other one. There you go. go I took ahead. her back to her eye doctor, and her eye doctor is Dr. Williams up in Newland, North Carolina. And when we went back there, he asked her what had happened to the stigmatisms. They were gone. She had had stigmatisms in both eyes, atrophied optic nerves. She had had no light perception in one eye and only a little light perception in the other eye. Her overall visual acuity was 2400. And we have papers which we're giving to Stephen saying that her visual acuity is now 2060 without glasses.
Thank you for consultation regarding Dixie Turbofil. <laughs> this 21-year-old woman with lifelong optic atrophy and poor vision described sudden vision loss in her right eye. I appreciate your notes describing her previously poor but measurable visual acuities in each eye. She says since this event about 12 days ago, she cannot even see light with the right eye. Her left eye is unchanged by history. On examination, she reports no light perception and has 2400 visual acuity. Uh, however, she has uh, stigmatisms, this is stigmatisms, in both right and left eyes. Her ventricular enlargement likely relates to cerebral atrophy. The neurologist, we need a neurologist to sort out whether there is any evidence of elevated intracranial pressure. And that's Dr. David Kimmel from Wake Forest University Eye Center. Then we have another report from Dr. Williams. Uh, oh, those reports, I'm sorry. The first report I read was July 27, 2000. The second report was April the 12th. So, so far we have stigmatisms in both eyes, no light perception in either eye. Um, at one point she had limited light perception in one eye, but then lost that. She had um, atrophied optic nerves. So this is the report. Now we went back. The October the 20th of 2006, after prayer, to whom it may concern. At, at present, Ms. Turbofield's current best overall visual acuity is 2060. This is an improvement over all previously recorded visual examinations. Her bilateral acuity is such that she may be able to apply for a limited driver's license. Yay! If you desire any further information, please feel free to contact me. Andrew L. Williams, Avery Eye Care Center. Doctor, this is Doctor Andrew L. Williams, Avery Air Eye Care Center in Newland, North Carolina. General optom optometry. Ever think about driving in your lifetime earlier? <laughs> no. <laughs> no? Not at all? Were, I, were you jealous of people that got to drive? Did you think about that stuff? Well, I, I always said that I always had to depend on people and I couldn't, I couldn't go anywhere without someone <laughs> having to take me and, and um, I always used to pray, Lord, when I get to heaven, will you at least let me drive a car on the streets of gold? <laughs> and, uh, cool. Someone told me, said, "Do you see? You won't, uh, you won't need a car when you get to heaven." They said, "You'll have wings." And I said, "Well, how do you know God won't have cars?" <laughs> because I want to drive sometime in my life. If it's not down here, at least when I get there. And they didn't say anything else after that. And um, I just kept praying and believing God. Even when people would pray and say, Lord, if it's your will to heal her, in my mind, I would say, Lord, it is your will, and I, I know that it's your will to heal me and do in my life what you said that you would do. And how old are you, girl? I'm 28. I just, I turned 28 February 22nd. February 22nd. Yes. And when did this wonder wonder event happen? Um, February 18th of 2006. February 18th of 2006. Now, where? what was the setting? What was going on? Was it a meeting or? We were having a prayer meeting in the basement of New Covenant Church. Three different streams of healing had come together to pray for people to be healed. Three different streams. What does that mean? Well, the John G. Lake stream of healing, which... John G. Lake had set up what were called healing rooms uh, at around the past, right past the turn of the century, and healing rooms still exist that come out of the John G. Lake tradition. Okay, that's one. That's one. Another one was the hunters. The, the hunters have had a lot of success praying for people with, with bone problems, limbs that are short, limbs that are um, crooked, uh, crippling diseases, etc. The hunters have had a lot of success with that. 
Now you said something about her her leg growing out. Her leg grew out two inches. Either her <laughs> leg grew out two inches, or when the crippling was healed, the leg straightened, and the effect of it was that the leg lengthened. But nevertheless, the leg became straight and sound. The foot rotated. I'd say her foot rotated 45 degrees in front of our eyes. And I remember <laughs> saying, I feel something. <laughs> I feel something, <laughs> but uh, that's all I remember. Something's happening. I, I feel it, and it did. It, I, when I came in, I and mean, when I walked out, I did. I had no support. She came in, being supported, being held. Her friend who brought her had to hold her, coming down the stairs and coming into the room had to support her. She didn't have her cane with her because she was coming down into the basement. So so our friend Veronica Brown literally supported her down the steps. Now what is the third stream? The third stream of healing is um, comes out of the tradition of Kenneth E. Hagen, okay. whose school is Rama Bible Training Center mm -hmm. in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, right. which I attended for two years. Yeah. And it's simply the power of God's spoken word. Rama actually comes from Alpha Mueda, and it means the spoken word. Literally, Rhema is the word of God quickened for a particular situation. And when the word of God, the written word, becomes a quickened and living word, the power of that word holds within it the seed to produce itself. So if you have a word on healing, that word on healing, if you receive it and absorb it into your life, carries within it the germ or the seed necessary to grow the healing power of God within you. And when Dixie came, Dixie had been meditating on the Word of God and was preparing her heart for healing. The young woman who came and brought her had been in, in some healing classes that I taught, simply teaching the Word of God on healing, line upon line, precept upon precept, from a little set of index cards that I've created for that purpose. Now, Sheila, describe, as you described to me a handful of times, the things that hadn't been done for her. All right. Dixie had been labeled in school as mentally retarded. And since she was cerebral palsied, blind, lame, and couldn't use her left hand, I think they just stuck the label of mentally retarded on her. She never was retarded. She's, she's sure of that, and so am I. Even in the uh, eye examinations, I mentioned that the, the neurologist or, or the neurological examination uh, aspect of her eye exam seemed to indicate what he thought was cerebral atrophy, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But I believe all this was, was false. Mm -hmm. I believe she was always very intelligent, sensitive, and creative. And because she was blind and lame, it was easier to be pushed aside than for the teachers to take the time to teach her. But when she came here, she could not add or subtract, multiply or divide. And, and were you talking about cutting her meat or buttering her bread or something like that? She, didn't, she had not been taught how to, how to hold a fork or a knife, how to cut with a knife. She didn't know how to cut meat. We had, I had to teach her to cut meat. Um, she had not had good use of her left hand. So that's part of the reason. But part of the reason was neglect. Um, now she's learning to play the dulcimer. She's noting, you know, doing the keys, uh, the strings on the dulcimer with that left hand that was once not useful. <laughs> this left hand was once not useful. And now she can play the dulcimer with it. And now would you tell that story about that, what you saw when you were little again right now? Um, when I was um, a child, I was 11 years old. And I had a dream and a vision of heaven, and I was there. I was in heaven. And I saw and heard all these little children playing, and I, were, I, were, I was playing with them. Now, and stand by for a minute. You said at one point that you had to be taken out of the home that you lived in. Uh, yes. Why was that? Because of a lot of family abuse and stuff that went on in alcoholism. 
Okay, so that's going on in the house when you're getting this. This is that's the kind of setting for the that then you had this this picture. Go ahead and now describe it. Um, I was uh, in heaven, and I was all the children were playing, and I could hear them playing. And I thought, wow, and I said, God, can I? Can I just stay here? And he said, and the Spirit of the Lord said, no. And I said, but God, it's peaceful here. I want to stay here. He said, no, you have to go back. And this was before I accepted Christ, basically as my Savior, but I had been to church and everything on special holidays and stuff. So I said, okay, Lord, if you want me to go back, I will. But I really would like to stay here. And that's all I remember. And then it was like I, I felt something like it, I was going back. And I woke up and I was in my room in my bed. And then I, I went back to sleep and I woke up the next morning. And uh, I remember telling my mother what I saw. And she said, what is wrong with you? And I said, nothing. I, I just went to heaven and all the children were playing and I was able to play there. And I said, I tried to ask God if I could stay, but he told me I had to come back, so I'm back. And when I was little, I would always ask my mom because all my brothers and sisters would leave me at home and I would be there with animals or whatever and they would be riding bicycles and doing all these things that I couldn't do. I said, Mama, am I ever going to be able to run? And she said, when you get to heaven? And I said, Mama, I sure hope it's not when I get to heaven. And I said, I hope it's before I go to heaven. And it was, it was several years. But it was because now I'm able to run and walk and ride the, ride the bicycle. Yeah. When I was in every high school and I was legally blind, I had a job coach. Uh, not a job coach, a, a PE coach. I can't remember his name, but um, but he brought in a bicycle and he taught me to ride a bicycle and I had um, my friend stand beside me to hold the bicycle up and I had one friend on the other side and she held my cane and then when I got balanced enough since I was familiar with the place I started riding the bicycle by myself and on warm days they would walk me to the track and I would ride the bicycle and the coach took pictures of me riding the bicycle and he went and got my teacher and told her to come down to the gym class and they helped me up on the bicycle and I just started riding it. Oh, cool. And it and everybody was like, Dixie, how are you doing this? I'm like, well, I'm familiar with the place. Now, this is a set of Sheila's healing scripture cards. And they're just, they are scripture. There are 100 cards. And each one of them, I keep hearing number 15. I don't know what's on number 15. See, I have a set of these. And sometimes I'll just pray. And I'll say, Lord, which one? <laughs> and I'll hear 42. Um, 15. Healing. Possible by God's power. Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heaven and the earth by your great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for me. And the word arm means Ben, and the word Ben means son. So it's talking about his son. We, you have made the, the heaven and the earth by thy great power and your, your son that stretched to the earth, and there is nothing too hard for you. That's Jeremiah 32, 17. And then Matthew 19, 26. 
But Jesus looked at them and said to them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And, he, and then Luke 18, 27. And he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. And this set of healing scripture cards, how um, you can get a set of these. Sheila is very liberal in sending them out. I think she said there's like been 2,000 sets of them sent out. And she has some, some studies in her, her home from time to time just using the cards which are just loaded with words and tiny little words of encouragement. Like, for example, on the first card it says, Prescription for your healing. Read these cards aloud, daily. Five cards per reading. Three to six readings per day. As you read the Word of God aloud and hear the Word, you will build up your faith to receive the healing God has already provided for you in Christ Jesus. I uh, went back to the uh, psychiatrist doctor, and I, he still had me on Selexa, and uh, I said, I don't feel that I need this, and he said, I'll cut it down to uh, 10 milligrams, and um, I said, I, I don't feel that I need this, thank you. And uh, so he said, I'll cut it down to 10 milligrams. And so then, and so then he said, and I want you to come back. And I said, I will not be back. He said, well, if you stop taking this um, medication and you, you have problems, then you come back. And so I go up to the desk and they say, Miss Turberfield, um, would you like another appointment? And I say, no, I don't. And they say, Miss Turberfield, you need another appointment. And I said, no, I don't, thank you. And they said, are you sure that you don't need another appointment? And I said, I am sure. I, I don't need this. There's nothing wrong with me. And so then I, I left, and I haven't been back since, but the night the deliverance came was when um, they said, would you like to burn the book? And I said, yes. And total deliverance from that medication came. And I started, um, um, Sheila said, now we're going to use wisdom. We're just going to... Well, you, you need to tell, tell a little bit about the book. There was this book. Oh, the book. Oh, they had a book that they wanted me to work in. And what was it called? It was called The Courage to Heal from uh, sexual abuse and child abuse. And so I worked in it for a little bit. But then I got to the point where I couldn't pick it up and I just kept thinking about all the bad things. Every time I would look at that book, all the bad things that had been written in the book and everything that had happened. And so we were in prayer meeting, and at this time I had uh, moved in with Sheila. And they said, well, would you like to burn the book? And we had the book, and we were praying. Would you like to burn the book? And they said, well, would you like to burn it? Would it just make you feel better? And I said, yes. <laughs> and so we, we put it in the book, we threw it in the book stove. In the what stove? In the book stove, the little wood stove uh -huh. and um, we burnt it <laughs> and they said now do you feel better and I was like well I need a, a little bit more prayer and so at this time we had already decreased the medication we she was said we're going to use wisdom we're going to start taking a half and then we'll go to a um, fourth so I said okay and I was taking a half for a couple days and the half of the piece of medicine fell on the floor and I couldn't find it. And so then I got another half, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm supposed to do this. Then that half fell on the floor. So I thought, okay, Lord, I guess I'm supposed to go to a fourth. And so I did for a couple of days, and then um, we, the night we had the Bible meeting, I'd taken a fourth. 
And so then they prayed, and it was like total deliverance came, and I still had the medicine, and I picked it up the next day, and I was getting ready to take the fourth. I was almost finished with the fourth, and the, the fourth of the piece fell on the floor. And I thought, well, Lord, what is this? And I picked up another fourth of a piece, and, the, and that piece fell on the floor. And I said, well, okay, Lord, are you telling me that I shouldn't take this? And it was like the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, you've been delivered from this. Do not put it in your mouth. And I said, okay, praise God. <laughs> so then I started, I told Sheila, and she said, well, let's just do something with it. And we did. Actually, I think we flushed it away. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't had problems since. And I told that doctor, I said, I will not be back in Jesus' name. Flat Out Miracle Films. Here you got me, and you got a <laughs> an electrical cord, and that's it. You know, it's kind of strange that through electricity we can be together, we can tell a story, we can repeat the stories. You used to have to crank up an Edison talking machine. You used to have to crank and create power for a telephone not so long ago, just a few years ago, when maybe your grandfather or your great-grandfather was still alive 150 years ago. That cord right there, that's heavy duty. That's communications. Stuff's happening here. The YouTube and the Google video and all that type of stuff. When I was a youngster, all you had was the pay phone. There was no cell phone. There was no computer. It's very interesting. There was not the means to simply make a movie and duplicate it in your home. You could not do that when I was a teenage character. That's interesting. That's interesting. Get the audience shout back. Praise heaven. Praise heaven.